Hello, you may think that a garden's an unusual subject for the South Bank Show, but this is a very unusual garden. It could be called one of the most original of gardens, because onto the country house garden I'm standing in has been grafted a living, visual representation of everything we know about the universe today. What we'll see is more of a vast work of sculpture than a conventional garden. The 2004 Gulbenkian Prize was won by the garden of the Scottish Gallery of Modern Art. That garden was designed by the architecture critic Charles Jenks. With his late wife, he also designed this garden, which continues to grow every year. He's taught in London and Los Angeles. His books, such as What is Postmodernism, have suggested a new way to consider all the arts. He came to the landscape late, but with huge ambition. This is called the Garden of Cosmic Speculation. It's open to the public only one day a year. Fundamentally, it's a private work of art here in the Scottish Lowlands. Nigel Waddis has made a film that investigates the thinking that underpins this garden of ideas. The garden's already inspired works from two composers, Michael Gandolfi and Stephen Goss. We'll be hearing some of that music in this film. Now, why is it called a fractal terrace? Right, well, it's a fractal over there, but it's a non-fractal here. This is uh, the right-angled world of the geometry, um, rectangles, squares, and what Plato thought underlay all the universe. And recently, we found out that really it's not that kind of geometry. It's this kind of geometry over here. So these are all fractals. They, they're transformations of these oblongs, rhomboids, and shapes that are self-similar, close to each other, but not exactly the same. And so they come out of the ground here as rectangles, and the rectangles morph into squares, and the squares morph into these rhomboids, and then they sink under the ground, and they emerge as teeth there. Those teeth are kind of fractal, too, in a way. Well, a fractal is a shape that has detailed structure on all scales of magnification. No matter how much you magnify it, instead of it just turning into some sort of smooth curve or surface, it's crinkly, it's wiggly, it's got, it's got structure. The reason those are important is that nature has many shapes of that kind. For example, a cloud. Clouds don't have sharp edges. Clouds have very, very fuzzy, very complicated edges. Um, trees, the way a tree branches, you've got big branches, little branches, twigs, tiny, tiny things. And the classical shapes of mathematics, the things in Euclid's geometry, like a sphere or a cone, are just not adequate for a mathematical understanding of those aspects of nature. In the 1960s, Benoit Mandelbrot discovered fractals. There's a prehistory. But the most important contribution Mandelbrot made was to show how these shapes link to the natural world. And for that, you need quite powerful computers. Those rectangles repeat themselves again and again and again. So they're self-same, where fractals are self-similar. And repetition is boring and dull and rather French, if you like, in a garden. And fractals, most of nature is fractal. This garden is a wonderful idea, but given clouds and given crystals, this still seems rather formal. I like the simplicity of formal architecture and formal garden design. And in a sense, I think all gardens are 
simplifications of, of real nature. In other words, it's not nature itself. In the Renaissance, they said, a garden is nature improved by art. And I take that point, that it's not real nature, it's nature improved. It's edited, just like a television program. You know, it's completely artificial. Well, let's go a bit <laughs> more artificial around here. Can we go that way? Yeah. If you look at these curves, again they're fractals because the curve lexicon is a series of Paisley shapes. It uh, doesn't matter the particular geometrical type you use, it's the self-similarities that, that is the key. And the fact that there's what's called an attractor basin, for instance there's an attractor basin right in there, which attracts the water and your eye to that area, the basin. Like it in a fast rushing stream between two or three stones there's this turbulence that gathers it changes all the time and it's still turbulence which gathers at that spot all the time exactly exactly yeah. and th that's the big idea is that if you ask what gives you identity it's this attraction which is always self-organizing toward a basin of organization that's the deep idea and that's a really profound one because it explains why your identity remains the same. But is Self same, different. but always different, always changing. Every day, your memory is slightly different. But uh, it's very, it's very, that's very akin to certain uh, aspects of Eastern philosophy, where he's talking about the river being always the same and always different. Uh, so there's a kinship there, isn't there? Absolutely. With Taoism. With, with yeah, Taoism, yeah. yeah. No. Those folded shapes, those fractal curves, uh, are dug out. And what we did was to dig out this area first, and the spoil we put over there. Um, so that's created by what came out of here? Yeah. Maggie said, let's make a place for our children to swim. Yeah. And so that goes down 14 feet. Is this, is this one of your jumping bridges? The next one is the jumping one. Here is a jumping seat uh, to the left here, made out of trunks and, and there you see a fractal because each one of these um, pieces is very much like uh, the, each piece of the sausage is like the next one and we've just put them in a line to sit to sit on and, and uh, have an area where you can see the, the mound from here. Yeah. Charles Jenks started to design the garden over 15 years ago with his late wife, Maggie Keswick. Maggie wrote and lectured about Chinese garden design, and many of the garden's early features were influenced by the Chinese philosophy of Taoism. So Maggie said, uh design me a bridge that uh, goes across here that I can sit on and look down as in China where you sit on the edge and you look over and you see a reflection and you see the fish passing. So I did that although it wasn't built until after she died and uh, then I put a statue over there yeah in a really peaceful part with, with a fern in there and the, you see the dead elm in there lying down so it is kind of a catastrophe area of um, destruction. And a hurricane comes in here and it blows everything down. These, these paths and these bridges, these jumping bridges, they're partly to do with the theory 
that you express in one of your books? Well, I wrote a book called The Jumping Universe, and the idea is that the universe doesn't just uh, unfold gradually, as Darwin said, but it also unfolds through a series of discontinuous jumps in organization. And so here the jumping bridge jumps over two little burns and jumps into the ground. You see, it goes into the ground there. And so the idea is really to celebrate that surprise. Um, you go very high, all the stair treads change in size. And so you sit over here and face the morning sun. If you have a, a seat, you can see <clears throat> sun comes up over there. It's a rather nice, peaceful part of the garden where all these curves come together. I presume you're saying evolution moves not only steady, but also moved at times very rapidly, and you're suggesting rather mysteriously rapidly. We're so used to Darwin, we're so used to the other view of evolution that it's all gradual, you know? It's all piecemeal, it's all step by step, but actually the universe is full of dramatic shifts, catastrophes, that are positive catastrophes, if I can call it that, as well as negative ones. An asteroid hitting us is an example. 65 million years ago, when dinosaurs were wiped out, that was a catastrophic change in organization. And it led, of course, to the evolution of, uh, of primates, and that led to us. On the Symmetry Break Terrace, the history of the universe is conceived as four breaks in symmetry. To the left is the origin, the era of energy, inflating in straight lines. With cooling, matter suddenly emerges, marked by a jump in the pattern that focuses on the opposite trees. Matter, according to Einstein, bends space-time, here shown by the curve of grass and pebbles. The third jump, life, is seen in the oval bowl focused on a tree and the fourth, consciousness, by the hedge that leaps the wall. And so we come to the uh, subatomic area of the garden. Right. <laughs> yes. And this is what? These are uh, explosions that nuclear physicists see when they aim to a proton and an antiproton at each other. Mm -hmm. And they hit and they create this incredible explosion. And from all these circles and spirals, they can measure the weight and type of a particle. They take a photograph of that. So that this, is a representation of what happens? That's the actual explosion. Right. But there's the photograph down there, you see. Right. So that's in two dimensions of a three-dimensional event. And that's the actual photograph they found the quarks in. That proved it. Uh, quarks are fundamental building blocks of matter. And along with electrons, quarks make up all the, the atoms and, and all the matter that we see around us in the universe. We've discovered these quarks, we understand what their properties are, but the one question we, we still have to answer is why quarks have the masses they do? Why are there some quarks which are heavy and some quarks which are light? Why do they differ in this way? And, and theoretically we believe the answer to this is due to another fundamental particle called the Higgs boson. And the laboratory in CERN in Geneva is building a new accelerator, which it is hoped in a few years will confirm the existence of this Higgs boson. Now, when they've actually put this puzzle together by finding the boson, the uh, final piece of the puzzle, what will they have proved? Well, then that'll prove that we really understand that this is a deep theory, that this theory is true. But you see, if they don't find it, and there are some people saying it doesn't exist, it means that a lot of the bets are off, and we've got, and there's something fundamentally wrong with the theory. And in fact, this uh, fence is in the shape of a linear accelerator, and that's why it has this curved shape. Believe it or not, this curved fence is to keep rabbits out. That's its function. <laughs> waves and this mound and all that. What's this saying about the theories that you're bringing to bear in this garden? Well, basically, waves underlie everything in the universe. You're a wave, I'm a wave, as well as a particle. And uh, if you look at 
water waves or the sound waves or shock waves. You see how ubiquitous waves are. Farmers here in this um, area and throughout the world plant in linear waves of crops, one next to another. So I suddenly saw that the idea of a wave as a language of landscape is a different idea that hadn't been used before in the landscape. So the, the total design of this garden is, is the metaphor of a landscape of waves. That's what I've um, sought. Is that uh, anything to do with the spiral that they're over there? Yeah, that mound is a double helix. Yeah. And so it's another DNA double helix. And if you walk up one path, you don't meet the people coming down the other path. So it's rather pleasant. Was that modeled on anything but the mathematical form? There's a famous stairway that Leonardo da Vinci designed for Francois Premier, the king of France, who had certain enemies. And when they'd come and visit, and he didn't want to see them, he would leave by one stairway as they arrived. So this is the DNA garden. Can you just give us an outline of what the whole garden is about and why you had this garden in this way? Well, it's uh, in a sense a traditional kitchen garden, except... Uh, the herb garden. You know, uh, a herb garden and also plants that we eat. And uh, there's roquette and lettuces and so forth. But it is more symbolic and ornamental than, than functional. There are six cells around us, and in the center, is the nucleus, and that's the, where the DNA comes from, and it, and it unwinds in these patterns here, yellow and dark green U, two different shades. They represent the ribosomes, and they come out from the nucleus, and printing out the message of DNA. In the center of each is a, one of the six senses, so that's the sense of touch, and you can see a uh, hand waving in the breeze there, and uh, pleasant things to touch, like dockweed and nasty things, a thistle and nettles. It heightens the sense of touch, in effect. Um, a garden is, in a way, a sensorium, so it's to increase uh, your sensitivity to um, the six senses. Yeah. This is taste, if you look. You can see, it's pretty obvious, the lips. And uh, in back, there's a tongue, a pierced tongue. And beneath it are wild strawberries. What so fascinates you about the DNA? Well, it, a lot of people say it's the big discovery of our time, that um, the atom of life we now understand, which underlies, as far as we know, every living thing there is. Yeah. Um, I thought it should have a place in the garden to be looked at, and really I used it because it's a structure. You know, you can, you can grow climbing plants up it. Here's another... Uh, center of a cell, another nucleus, another DNA. And it's the most, in a way, it's the prettiest because it's got this wonderful silver plant called Anaphilus growing in the center. And you can see, if you look up, you can see this parabola, which the wind turns and it makes all those nice chiming noises. And underneath you can see, if you... The ear. The ear. So yeah. you give it a hit and you hear it. One's a nice sound, one's a kind of clang. Um, so it's the sense of sound. Um, it's like an ear trumpet. Come along this way. This is the sixth sense, Melvin. It's um, a generalized sense. And 
it focuses on this woman and her fingers, like tentacles, are out there picking up the vibrations of the universe. And what she does is she looks at her brain because a perception really is an interaction between your brain and your mind, your culture, your thoughts, and what you perceive. And, and I, I wanted to show that as an active. There's, there's Coleridge, you know. He, Coleridge said, you know, perception is active. It's not passive. So the sixth sense is the sense of intuition, the female sense, and that's a woman. Uh, Maggie said one day, I said, what is female intuition? She did, she did this. <laughs> sense of the mood, you know, uh, a feeling for what's happening. This one is a rebus, and a rebus is Elizabethan idea of combining letters and objects to create meaning. Here it is, U, C, B, 4, you unlock the wheel of time, a great chain of rings. Then it's three absent DNAs, most of our body's junk DNA, and then some more cultural DNA, R, U, open to C, fan, this is a fan, fantastic, links, or do you call a spade, a spade, and three, junk DNA. And the last set, great, it's a greater, great power, that's a spark plug, great power chains one to excess. So wrench open your mind's eye, there's an eye, and jump, it's a jumping frog. C, file, record, a date. 2000. That's when it was uh, finished as part of the garden. On the greenhouse roof, equations that govern the universe, that breathe life into the universe, are conceived as flames against the sky. Scientists are decoding the universe. They reveal some of its ultimate patterns and equations, but they may miss the significance, beauty, or horror of what these laws imply. One of the most extraordinary recent discoveries is the existence of black holes far out in space. These are represented in another part of the garden by a black hole terrace. A black hole is essentially a dead star, a star that's run out of its nuclear fuel and stopped shining, and so it collapses under its own weight so dramatically that it punches a hole in space and time, because, of course, a black hole sucks up all the matter and that disappears down its own plug hole. It's been suggested that a black hole marks a boundary to space and time, sort of a border to our universe. When he was creating the garden, Jenks had discussions with many leading scientists, one of them, the cosmologist Lee Smolin. Yeah. So how do we represent this increasing strength of gravity as you get right here into the singularity? Well, there's a problem because it becomes infinite. So becomes you'd, infinite. you'd have to have something that's sort of, you know, if you had a slope, the slope sort of has to, you know, curve okay. off to an infinite slope. Okay. So, well, but, 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 I mean, you have something else that represents it here, which is just the fact that the thing comes to a point. It comes to zero. And, and maybe that's enough. Right. What you really want to get across is that there's no choice. You inexorably fall to the singularity. So that's, the, I would say, that's the most important thing to represent. Can we talk in a little more detail then about this black hole terrace that we're sitting on? Well, this is a terrace to eat on, and Maggie and I used to come out here and eat, and, and we'd sink into the, the ground because it was so wet. So, you know, on these thin chairs, uh, you'd be in about four inches. So we, I had to build a concrete terrace. And then having do, to do that, um, at, this, at that time, we were discovering that black holes uh, were very important, maybe at the center of every galaxy. So I thought, 
lets uh, black holes rip space-time apart. So there's a series of black lines coming to the landscape here. And you can see a tilted um, grid behind me. And you fall into that grid because gravity is working. It pulls you in, literally. Sure. And you're pulled towards the center, the singularity. And uh, you're spaghettified, all that stuff that happens if you fall into a black hole <laughs> for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> So why does fractal geometry, to take one uh, aspect of the thing, why does that attract you so much? And why do you believe in it, as it were? Because I think one can introduce that word at this stage uh, so strongly. Well, you, you look at this black hole and you see these, these, rect these warped rectangles of uh, aluminium and astroturf, and they are fractals of each other. Um, each one is slightly different from the next one, and they're all bent by space-time warp. Now, why am I attracted? Because why are you attracted to a symphony that's always changing the themes? Why is a good novel always fractal in its organization? And why do we like it? Because it's closer to how our perceptions really work than a predictable novel. In other words, I think we learn something deep about the nervous system, about our personalities. When we look at fractals, the universe is basically a fractal. We live in a fractal universe. <laughs> Self-similar. Self-similar. But not the same. But not the same. Yes. Yeah. Your children, or my children, are like us, but different in important ways. And it's that, that deep truth, which fractal architecture, fractal landscape, and fractal music present to us. And I think that we, in, we, we intuitively, you know, I wouldn't buy this if I didn't feel, if it wasn't a feeling deep in me before it's a thought. I, I, this is why, you know, it goes back to the Romantics after, after all. They, they discovered these truths in the 18th century. The only thing is that they couldn't prove them because Newtonian physics and Euclidean geometry had such a stranglehold on us. When you yeah. said the romantic poets of 150 years understood but couldn't prove it, can you give us just can you give us one or two examples of what you mean by that? Well, the painter Caspar David Friedrich, for instance, painted a wonderful uh, catastrophe of a boat falling over in an ice floe, and the foreground has these fractal-like icebergs, which is really the subject of the painting. And they're really a celebration of ice and crystalline form. And those forms are the ultimate shapes of nature. But that painting never became understood as a, as a deep insight into nature. In other words, it was Cezanne's understanding of nature ba based on equilateral triangles and Euclidean geometries, which prevailed. And you find it in, in words, you find it in the, in the essays of uh, Coleridge, for instance, don't you? And in Coleridge and Wordsworth and I think the nature poets, I think they understood the deep truths of self-similarity of the way the generations reiterate each other and always change them slightly. They understood all of those points of unity and variety and, and the variety of nature, you know, and its constant growth and change as the basic uh, laws of the mind. The imagination I hold to be the living power and prime agent of all perception. Poetry is the impassioned expression which is in the face of all science. Beauty is truth. Truth, beauty. That is all ye know on earth, and all ye need to know. If you just stray into this garden, I suppose the chief feature will be the waves. The waves were, were an early idea, and in Chinese gardens, they are a miniaturization of the far landscape. And so we thought of the hills around here, these geological forms, and they were waveforms, and so we wanted to pull them in. And that led to these uh, soliton waves. A typical wave seen on a pond dissipates, and when it encounters another wave, adds up or cancels out. Soliton waves are particularly interesting because they can travel through each other and keep their identity. 
In the garden, solitons are presented in a group of gates. Here, waves of energy are shown traveling through the metal in a series of twists. a lot in architecture, you've written a great deal, you are very eminent as a critic. What did you bring, as it were, to the garden from that past? Well, behind uh, the last 35 years of my life has been uh, writing on architecture, contemporary architecture, and a lot of architects are involved with the kind of work we're doing here. Um, a good friend of mine is Frank Gehry, and uh, in Bilbao and many of his recent buildings. He's created a curvilinear language of architecture. So it's really part of a, of a larger movement, what I'm doing here. Um, and I brought that from architecture. It focused my mind. Also the symbolic thing. I mean, I've always been very interested in symbolic architecture. I wrote a book on it. And so, you know, the elements of this garden all symbolize something in the universe. Although the Garden of Cosmic Speculation is a private garden, it's occasionally opened up to the public to raise money for the cancer charity his wife created in her final months. When it opened last year, the lanes surrounding the house quickly became impassable. Part of the reason for the popularity of last year's Open Day was the announcement that another Jenks design had won the prestigious Gulbenkian Prize. Britain's biggest arts prize has been awarded to a special garden at the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art in Edinburgh. The Gulbenkian Prize, worth £100,000, rewards the most original project in a UK museum. The success and popularity of his garden designs have led to an additional career for Jenks as a landscape architect. He's currently designing a new public park in Milan, as well as two reclamation projects for disused coal fields. One in Scotland, featuring a lake in the shape of the country, and another in Northumberland, featuring a quarter of a mile long female landform, the goddess of the north. He was asked to design the keynote garden at the prestigious Chaumont Garden Festival in northern France. His Curse of Agamemnon garden, complete with chaotic attractors and a machine gun cascade, was part water garden, part funfair, and a visual essay on the condition of war. Are there any particular ideas gardens, gardens of ideas of a particular period or even a specific garden that you especially admire? I'm a great admirer of the Italian garden of Villa Lante, uh, north of Rome. It's in a, a Renaissance garden which spills down a hill and at the top of that hill is a source and the water trickles down a cascade. And it represents to the, uh, the cardinal who built it the evolution from primitive society through a progressive narrative to the 16th century, arts and sciences of its time. So this garden in Italy, the Villa Lante, really tells a narrative story, uh, a mythic story. One corner of Charles Jenks' garden that draws inspiration from the Villa Dante is the Universe Cascade. This waterfall presents the entire history of the universe as we currently understand it, from creation to the present day and looks beyond. So it 
coming up out of the quantum soup. That's the origin of the universe down there. Here is the beginning, which is the inflationary period. That's why all these steps are stretched. And it led to the first jump here. This is gravity, electroweak force, and the strong force. And you see them split. And then here is what it looked like about 100,000 years after the beginning. It was still a complete soup. And then suddenly, photons uncoupled from matter, and there was light. So this split here is very important. Let there be light. That's, yeah. that's the genesis. And then 60 million years later, you get galaxies and you get stars. Um, what I love about this one is, you, you know, these rocks. They look Those very are from much, the river. Yeah. Those are from the river, yeah. They look very much like the um, pictures that Hubble gives. And then you get that jump, which is really maybe one of the most important of all, because everything which develops after depends on it. And that is the supernova. The red rocks and the black rocks uh, are exploding apart. You see from the center in there? Yeah. And they come out an explosion. And that's what seeds the universe. So if you didn't get that jump, you wouldn't get life. So jumping forward, you get planets, Mars, the Earth unfolding. Finally, after nine billion years, up here you get life. It takes nine billion years before life evolves. Can you see the words, life, eat life there, yes. in the rocks? Yeah, I can see it, yeah. And you can see it's in the shape of a woman, sort of screaming, because life had nothing to eat but itself, so it eats itself, rather. And carry on. Always getting more complex as we go up the, the stages. This is the kind of tabloid era of the universe. This is Hello Magazine. Come on, come and have a a, uh, a peekaboo. You see, it's a beautiful limestone rock from China. I mean, what a piece of sculpture, nature's yeah. sculpture. All the fish, or spermatozoa, and then the extinctions, 505 million years ago. And then uh, a mushroom cloud. The great mass extinction that we all know about when an asteroid hit the, the Gulf of Mexico, a mushroom cloud, and it killed the dinosaurs. And that led to this jump, which was the rodents and big-brained animals, which led ultimately to chimpanzees, the primates, and then to us. Then the jump into civilization and, of course, Stonehenge and the great circles and geometric forms of the Egyptians. So mathematics, religion, and on we go to the modern period, modernity, here. As, as water flows down, time goes up, and we reach the crisis moment of the great mass extinction caused by us, which is on this platform here. This is, uh, here we are at modernity, and you can see the word modernity here in the stones, as well yeah. as um, the steel, the rust, the rust belt. This is Pittsburgh. This is uh, civilization falling to pieces. And you come along here, and you say, what's the problem? And then you look in the mirror, and you see, well, we're the problem. You see? Right here. You're the problem. <laughs> You're in the mirror. Well. <laughs> you will be soon. <laughs> and uh, then you find the Eucharist, the idea, the Christian idea that everything eats everything else, that the universe is one great happy meal. And you look up at the heavens, you look through this hole, you have to step in after me, but you look up and you see the heavens and cascading down, well, have a look on your head, don't bump your head, are the famous uh, proportional numbers of the Fibonacci series. Oh, the Fibonacci. So we finally got to Fibonacci. In the 13th century, there was an Italian mathematician who invented a series of numbers, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. Each number is the previous two added up. To Fibonacci, this was just a, an exercise in arithmetic. Then, about 300 years ago, people started to notice that out in the real world are Fibonacci numbers. For example, the, the best place to find Fibonacci numbers is in plants. If you count the petals on flowers, 
Very often you get Fibonacci numbers. A lot of plants have five petals. Some flowers will have 55, 89. You see a pattern of seeds on the sunflower, and these seeds arrange themselves in spirals. And when you do the mathematics on that and link that geometry to the numbers, these Fibonacci numbers and the whole way of generating them just comes out of the mathematics because the rules of growth are precisely the rules that will give rise to these numbers. What do you make of the fact that the, so much of the life that is around is based on mathematical formulae discovered by this 13th century Florentine Fibonacci? The underlying nature of the universe had to produce these, not the numbers per se, but the way of organizing space and time. Mm. And so nature takes a long time, maybe a billion years, to discover that's the best way to be. But once it discovers it, um, it becomes a kind of beautiful solution to close packing, to getting the maximum amount of light, the maximum amount of water, the maximum. The, max, the, the, the max amount of strength in that form, and, and uh, then we discover it, you know, in the 13th century. If you think of it this way, you could say that the, that beauty and mathematics are something real, and they're underlying the cosmic code. The, the, behind the whole universe is this potential form, uh, rather a platonic idea, that beneath it all is a kind of cosmic code. This is a fairly pessimistic ending, isn't it? Well, the universe doesn't end or here. A very it's just pessimistic present. No, it's a present. Uh, it's the great battle between economy and ecology. But the actual present uh, is up at that level, which is unoccupied, because you're meant to stand there. And down there, we have. Can you tell us what that uh, leaf figure is in the in the uh, quantum? That's uh, that's a fountain. It's nine baby universes, which uh, are hit by water that comes out of the nose, and they rotate. Um, the idea here is that we might be in multiple universes. We used to think that the universe meant everything, but now it seems that there may be other parallel universes existing in a higher dimensional space, which has been called the multiverse. So our universe may be one of possibly an infinite number of other universes within this multiverse. One of the reasons why physicists quite like this idea is to understand why our universe has the properties that it does. You know, how come uh, gravity is of a particular strength, or the charge on the electron is, is of a particular st uh, strength? Why the speed of light is what it is? What if they could be something else? In fact, why is everything in our universe so fine-tuned in order for us to exist? And the beautiful, simple explanation for this is that, well, maybe all possible universes could exist, popping out of this multiverse. Some didn't quite have the right ingredients to survive and fail and collapse. Others may have the ingredients to survive, and they will continue to expand and grow out of their own Big Bang, like ours. Uh, so we've got three different universes, which are big. One, two, and three. That's a failed universe over there. And then that universe, which we've walked through and towards to get into our universe, um, and the idea is to show these new ideas of cosmology that are coming forward. Multiple universes, membrane universes, and the waveforms down there are the fundamental metaphors of the garden. We're sitting in the garden of cosmic speculation. Why do you call it that? When you make a garden, you're speculating on what's underlying nature. That's what a gardener does. Also, I was writing a book, uh, working with scientists and others, trying to figure out what these new languages of nature were. And it was the combination of those two ideas which led me to say, well, what are the basic laws of the universe? What underlies the universe? How does the universe work? Are you trying to find uh, a way of illustrating what you think of, as you call, the new languages of science? I wouldn't call it an illustration so much as a um, presentation of new metaphors about nature. And that makes it more speculative. In other words, nature, as understood by philosophers and scientists, is one thing. 
For instance, scientists tell us that the universe started in a Big Bang. And I speculate that that's a crazy metaphor. It wasn't big, it wasn't a bang, no one heard it. it your mother wasn't a firecracker. So I've used this garden as an instrument to get down to the basic metaphors that could be behind it all. But I call it a cosmic passion. And it's a passion to understand where we are. We all have that. If you look around at prehistoric works in the landscape like Silbury Hill and stone circles, those were speculations on cosmic reality. And so what, what I'm doing, in a sense, is, is the traditional thing, you know. In your book about this garden, you use the word cosmogenesis. Where does that come from, and what do you mean by it? Cosmo, cosmos, means the organization of the universe. And so cosmogenesis means the unfolding, self-organizing universe over its 13.7 billion year history. So it's a story like the Genesis myth. What's so interesting about the Bible is that it tells you a story of how God as the architect of the universe created first the physical things and then the living things and then human things. And in a way, what we're hearing from Cosmogenesis is a related story. It's got a bigger picture. It's got a much longer period. But it's still a narrative and we can still tell it. And it orients us. So most importantly, it's a myth which locates us in cultural space and time, just the way the Genesis myth did for 2,000 years. I see this as part of a, of a long, maybe 500-year shift of the human species to understand where we are in a deeper way.